to just start by telling me a little bit about the sort of materials that you use in your sculptures. Okay, um, I think I began using found materials from the streets um, in the very early 1990s, I suspect. Um, and in, in the first instance, of, I mean, strange enough, they were um, old um, sort of industrial warehouse dollies, um, which I used to support panels of um, vivid colour. Um, and from, so the, from the warehouse dollies, um, I started using, um, again, sort of recycled light boxes. Um, the ones that would be near restaurant signs or exit signs or advertisements one kind or another. Uh, which used to come in these steel or aluminium sort of rectangles that would you know, attach to the side of a building and they would often get recycled through some of the salvage companies that um, are all over East London. So I would kind of either find them or, or buy them from these secondhand places and then adapt them for these rather large towers of um, vivid coloured light. I mean all, all of the objects I've used are, are vehicles for colour essentially. Uh, um, ways of supporting and presenting often very vivid sometimes illuminated color so yeah um warehouse dollies light boxes um scrap plastics of one kind or another often that have been laser cut so they've already in various shapes and forms um and in a way i mean i think oh you know a lot of the leftovers from the studio which is slightly different maybe from going out into the streets and finding things, but like old spray paint cans I've made into, um, I've used as sculptures, and the, the tops of tins of enamel paint. So in a way it's, there's always, a, you, you, there's always stuff that's nominally waste. And you know, that's always worth looking at in my experience. And is that, is your use of waste or leftovers, is that, uh, an economical decision or is it, are you just drawn to them for the colour? Why, why not use new things? What's the motivation there? I mean again, I, given I've been doing this lark for you know 30 odd years now, obviously your motivation and your ideas change over time but originally it, it, I mean, both, you know, it's cheaper I mean you know much cheaper so it was an economical issue but it wasn't just that because it was also something about things that have already been used and that have been marked by use have a kind of history and a kind of personality almost that um, new things don't have. And also you feel that you have to adjust to them. They precede you and they precede your work. So there's always a job of saying, okay, well, what, what, what will this allow me to do? And what will it enable me to do? So there's a sense of which you know, you're giving those objects a certain amount of respect. You know, also, anything's better than the blank canvas, you know, which is sort of, or, or the blank page if you're, you know, writers. If it's something's already got a form and a character, then it's it's already begun, you know, and and you can work with it. I think, or well, that's at least that's how I found it. I mean, there are there are also you know, ecological, you know, questions about. Although I have to, you know, say that when I first began making these works, that wasn't at the front of my mind, but it was also, you know, it was always. Is always there you know and it's an unavoidable issue and it's become more unavoidable you know, in more recent years i guess yeah absolutely and what do you, to what extent does the sort of gathering of those materials become part of the process i mean i would get quite obsessed with finding this you know when it was the dollies i just had to, i had to, i was i'd find whenever i was out on the you know on the street shopping or anything I was always had an eye out for some dollies, and if if I found them when I was you know about to go to dinner, then you know dinner had to be delayed. It was the, the prior, you know, it was quite. And I realised I could get slightly manic about this, and then light boxes became you know, a thing, and I was hunting them down. I was looking at them enviously on the sides of buildings, thinking you know, I could I could really do something with that one. So you have to kind of you know you have to check yourself a bit at times, but. Um, it is part of the pleasure of it because you never quite know when you're going to come across something and you never know quite what form or shape it's going to take and you never quite know whether you can use it in the end you, know, you get it back to the studio and sometimes they just don't they just don't work it keeps you on your toes 
yeah I know exactly what you mean I do a lot of um, picking up of rubbish as part of my work um, and just now it's polystyrene packaging that I'm after and, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and I'll see some you know behind a closed fence or something and I'll go back like every day to see if I can get in and, um, I mean I it's ridiculous but I, I get a bit of a kick out of out of that and somehow I do think as I've done that more and more it's become uh, so I'll maybe look out for opportunities to to find an unusual material so I can go to a particular type of industry or um or just yeah it's the joy in in as you said it's a bit like if you're if you're into car boot sale rummaging or something it's it's the joy of finding just the right thing yeah and, I, and there was another material I found myself using was electrical flex you know which always has a, a, a colored plastic surface you know, i mean often black and white but also you know, all the various electrical colors and and um and actually that began because i'd been making these light boxes and you know they'd had long cables attached to the back of them these, these tall towers and i installed some in a show actually at tate and they it, they all failed the electrical tests uh, the pat tests mm -hmm. the and this was actually because the wires were a bit too thin and they, there was a drop off in the anyway uh so tate being tate it packaged all the cabling up in these sort of um, you know um, archival boxes and sent them back to me on a you know, on a on a air conditioned truck <laughs> and it was just like heaps of this shit and um, and I thought well I've got to do something with it and I just began to wrap them up and roll them up into like industrial versions of those elastic band balls and you'd have you know then I had a big roll of black flex and then I got a big roll of white flex and then I thought oh I could do more of this. And, it, and at some point, um, probably quite a bit later, Bloomberg, the, the company, got in touch with me and said they were planning on doing some um, a project, getting artists and designers to use their waste materials. And you know, and a sort of you know, it was a bit of a greenwash on you know what they do. And and I said, well, you don't happen to have any coloured electrical flex, do you? You know, this is the company that produces enormous quantities of you know, computing material. And they and a truck turned up with three tons of the stuff on the back of it. And which then some of which became these various balls of flex, which I called dog days, um, which I showed in in Edinburgh, Ingleby and elsewhere. So, you know, I mean and then yeah, so electrical flex so suddenly you know, I'd walk past a dump and I'd see all this colored flex and I'd think, oh man. And I think, well don't be ridiculous. You know, there's so there's so much of this stuff if you need it at some point you have to stop yourself collecting these. yeah thankfully you kind of you get bored with with your that particular preoccupation after a certain point but then it's always just, just another one that just takes over your priorities can change in that sort of desperation like suddenly the thing you know it's so, so valuable to you that waste product that, that you'd swap something that's yeah um, no no it becomes kind of everything all consuming and and you think, well, if I don't get this now, you know, someone else will have it. You know, and then people go, you know, I don't think anyone else is ever going to take that. <laughs> you know? it's, I think you're safe on that one. <laughs> and do you ever paint things or do you always use just the colour of the material? Um, well, the, 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 found, the found objects, you know, the, the dollies and the light boxes, they're often very neutrally coloured. They're metal or, you know, they're rusted or something. And that's quite useful for me to then put something a very vivid color within that um, so they're a kind of support they're essentially they're a support for the colors and so the more neutral and you know not those colors they are then in a way the better they they are for me the electrical flex is obviously a bit different than that i mean it's hard not to read that piece without thinking about um recycling and sustainability was that part of the motivation for making the work or was it is that just completely incidental part of it it wasn't it wasn't the entirety i mean it, probably the probably the for my first thought was oh there's some good color and you know and that's that's what gets you in, that's what got me interested in the that particular material and then i then i had to think well okay how can i how can i exploit this you know i didn't want to buy up all these shelves in the supermarket and then just, tip the stuff down the drain that wasn't that wasn't really going to work um 
but I'd already had, I, I mean, again, I had the ones I'd made have not been huge, but, you know, I've often worked, well, I always worked in a big shared studio, so, you know, it's quite easy to get people to deliver, you know, their leftovers. But I had an idea of doing a project where I'd actually, it would be entirely made from visitors to a gallery or a museum, that they would bring the, you know, the product, you know, the empty bottle, and I'd, and I'd literally have to make it out of what was gifted to the, to that space and I'd still like to do that um, at some point. Yeah I think it's a nice engagement tool actually get help getting people involved in in gathering the materials. Yeah. I think it's just um, another, another way in sort of for people. I think that's I do I've always been very fond of that type of art where you can see that the materials are really very ordinary and it's no it's no magic what I do it's it's very obvious what I'm doing you know it's no there's no sleight of hand in it. And it's just a, you know, it's just an, a minor alteration of the object, which makes that object suddenly very visible, whereas often it's quite invisible because it's so ubiquitous. And I'm very attached to that way of working. Yeah, you don't seem to uh, interfere too much with, with the things. They're sort of presented as they are or maybe grouped. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. That the more you mess with them, the less interesting it generally gets. And I think this is a problem for a, a, you know the kind of modern studios that you get all these raw materials coming in, and the more you work on them, the somehow they lose more than they gain. I mean, the, I've often used this phrase by um, the painter Frank Stella about he when he was making a painting, he wanted it to look as good as the paint to look as good as it was in the can. Yeah, and the danger is that once you take it out of the can, it gets less interesting. But you know, but that moment when you open a tin of paint, and you've got that pure liquid colour, I mean, it's, it it is magical, and I'm never tired of that. But it's incredibly hard to make something that would be as vivid as that. Can you tell me about the unplugged piece about how you sourced and all the all yeah. different materials in that? I became. I became the most sought after guy in the pound shops of East London for a while. <laughs> I became hot property and the whole families would come out and welcome me because I'd go in and um, I mean, yeah, well, what I noticed was that pound shops, which you, know, you have everywhere and they are sort of universal it seems, um, wherever you are. And, yeah, I mean, there's some great ones in Glasgow on Trongate, I seem to remember. Um, and in East London and, and, you know, and every other city. And what I noticed is that a lot of these incredibly cheap, you know, very disposable plastic objects are often very vividly coloured. And it's the vivid colours almost like it's a symbol of, you know, your, your cons people who consume when they can't afford to, you know, it's like, it's the, it's the lowest level of consumption you can do. And it's really, you know, kind of a bit bleak. But there's some, there's a kind of, Color is always a, almost always a, a component of this very, very low level um, consumption, um, and I just thought, okay, well, I better, I better, you know, make something out of this. So I'd go into the pound shops on Bethnal Green Road and elsewhere, and, and I'd end up buying like sixty quid's worth of stuff. You know, that's when they, that's when they began to like me. You know, uh, <laughs> and. <That's the> <laughs> And then you'd start noticing patterns in them, you know, that certain kind of objects are available and, and also that almost, almost everything was made in China. Um, all these very cheap plastic objects. So I, I just began to kind of accumulate them. I mean, that's what I, I guess I generally do. I accumulated dollies and light boxes and, you know, they, they end up piling up in the studio and then I have to figure out what I can do with them. And, the, you know, the, the dollies were able to like stay on the ground and support these monochrome panels. The light boxes I tended to stack up on top of one another. The um, the pound shop objects, these cheap plastic knives, forks, um, pegs, brushes, you know, whatevers. Um, I ended up attaching them to uh, pillars of Dexia and of you know, this sort of perforated steel. So they just became these rather sort of slightly um, flimsy pillars of colour um, and, they, and, and I, I was actually I began pretty much to do them for a show in uh, the Talbot Rice Galleries in Edinburgh and once I realised I had a big gallery to fill I just had, then had to you know lean into it um, and you know and I went a bit kind of crazy about 
you know, which is the best pound shop in London. You know. um, Am I right? And what about the little concrete plinths? What 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 started that? Wait there. <coughs> this is the first one. Um, number one, which was uh, twenty twelve, and it basically it's I I I I've been you know going it's very dusty. I've been going around the streets as I do, and one thing I noticed that you see in almost every city certainly London and Glasgow and elsewhere, uh, when people want to deter, you know, burglars and vandals, they stick broken glass in, on the sides of walls, or, you know, on sort of low-rise walls. Um, and it's pretty, you know, aggressive stuff, and it's not pretty. But I thought, it just occurred to me that, well, maybe this is a way I can, you know, I can use coloured glass, you know, and just support it by sticking it in concrete. And, and it seemed to me both to refer to the city, the street, the vernacular of sort of everyday life in the city. And it was a way of supporting vivid color um, without being too pretty, maybe. You know, it's, there's a little bit of aggression in it. And then, you know, so I've done lots of these ones with glass. Um, and the concrete become, you know, the, which is again, it's a, it's a beautiful material and it's very much a material of, of the city, obviously. And I realized that the concrete's like the, the kind of neutral base I was talking about with the dollies and with the light boxes. It's, a, it's a, obviously a gray material and it's just a brilliant material for supporting color. So you know, I did the glass and I still do the glass ones occasionally, uh, but I found it could also support uh, off cuts of acrylic or um, well, again, these um, the tops of tins of, tins of paint, tops, acrylic. Um, Odd rulers and uh, I mean just yeah, almost anything mm. and some just very random found objects and they could just you know if in doubt stick it in concrete yeah <laughs> it's like a glory uh, floor but in three dimensions yeah yeah and so um and I and again that's been ongoing now for quite a long time and a lot of the work in the Ingleby show was of these small objects embedded in concrete and I've been making kind of bigger ones uh, since then, um, not, I think when my feeling about the Ingleby, Ingleby got a very beautiful gallery, um, and, but it's very big, and too many little objects can look a bit cute sometimes. I was slightly bothered by that, uh, and I think it, the sh I felt the show needed something slightly more impolite in the space, and I think a larger, heavier, more awkward um, version of one of those or something or something would have been helpful and so I basically came back to the studio I've been making making ones which are about I mean this is obviously you know what 15 centimeters high by 20 wide um, the bigger ones are now sort of you know one meter 50 tall um, and I'm my aim is still to make them where they are sort of floor based full size you know two meter jobs problems that attach to that are that they get unbelievably heavy Hmm. Um, and I've never made heavy sculpture. I mean, well, I suppose I have if you add it all together, but actually it's usually like, I always think of my work as kind of flat pack sculpture, like the dollies or the, uh, the light boxes. You can always take them, you can take it all apart and pack it up into different boxes. And, but you know, a, a single solid, un indivisible lump of a sculpture is something I've never actually made, I don't think. And they bring all sorts of issues with them. Yeah, it's nice. Trying to move them. Yeah, they're bloody nuisance. I mean, I can tell you, I certainly haven't been making any during the lockdown. I mean, why would I? You know, there's a whole load that are meant to go out to an exhibition in Rome and one in London, and you know, they're all just waiting here. Just any thoughts on the kind of sustainability issues? I mean, I know you you mentioned earlier that it started off as a sort of um, economically motivated because it's yeah. and obviously um, I'm sure that's changed and have have you had to question your choice of material or the ethics around buying plastic things like that yeah. yes is the simple answer and um, I mean I guess I mean clearly you know in in 
particularly in most recent years, you know, the, the, the issues of using plastics has become very prominent and rightly. And, you know, and I do use quite a bit of plastic and I do, I do buy it, some of it from you know, suppliers. I mean, the only thing I would, I make sure of is that whatever plastic I buy, none of it leaves the studio as waste. I mean, it seems to me the problem with plastic is not the material itself, which is, you know, well, the materials themselves, which can be fantastically useful and, and, are, and, and are, I would say, indispensable in some respects. The problem is what, how we dispose of them and when they become waste. And if you can either use waste plastics, which I do to some of the time, to take them out of that cycle, then that obviously is a minor help. But also just simply to not let any of anything from the studio become waste seems to me to be, and it may not be enough, but it's at least it's something. And so all the offcuts I get from the acrylic place, you know, none of it gets chucked. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, for me in the end, you know, the, the, the work I, all my work is about color and it has been for, you know, 30 odd years now. And boy, do plastics have good colors. <laughs> this is, you know, I mean, I can, I could spend all day, you know, worrying about the ethics of plastic, but, you know, just look at one, you think, oh God, that's beautiful. You know? So it, it, it's, it's a tension without doubt. And it will remain that, and it, you know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you, know, you shouldn't use plastics because I think that would be kind of absurd and impossible. At the same time, I'm not going to say, you know, my work is so important I don't care about these issues, which of course is completely wrong at the other end of the scale too. So, you know, I, I will, I will survive within some of these contradictions somehow, I guess. <laughs>